right, welcome everyone to my weekly recap or participation video. As I read through uh, the responses, there seems to be um, a good breadth of topics, right? So, I, I mean, I definitely see a, a good amount of related rates, but I also see implicit differentiation. I see stuff um, about rates of change. I th see things about linearizations. And so I decided, you know, as I look at all this, and there's a substantial number about, you know, each one of these categories, that I would go ahead and choose these examples, kind of one from each. So this is our 2.6, this is implicit differentiation sort of deal. Here's 2.7, that's rates of change. Here's 2.8, that's related rates, and here's 2.9. So these are going to be the problems that I'm covering in this uh, review video. If you'd like to, go ahead and pause and try these problems out first, and then have me explain them to you. All right, I'm feeling that this is going to be a long video, so let's dive right in. Example number one, find the equation of the line, or the tangent line, to this curve at the point 1, 1. So whenever you see something right, where it's not solved y equals, whenever it's not y equals, so in this case it's definitely not y equals, and it'd be quite difficult to get it in the form y equals, in this case, we need to use implicit differentiation. That's how these things differ from kind of, you know, 2.1 through 2.5. All of those really we had y equals. So, okay, let's go ahead and do implicit differentiation. Well, first of all, don't forget about the right-hand side. If I take the derivative of 6, I'm going to get out 0. So that's nice and easy. I'll start off with the easy stuff. Now, on the left-hand side, if I was to take the derivative of x squared, well, this just follows our normal rules. So here's the power rule. If I was to take the derivative of 2xy, remember this is the same thing as 2x, this function, times the function y, right? So I'm going to need to use the product rule in this case. So I'm going to do the derivative of the first, that's 2, times the second, plus the first, 2x, times the derivative of the second. And okay, remember we're looking for y prime here. The derivative of y is going to be y prime. That's the best we can do about this. I uh, don't really know what it looks like yet. I'm going to go ahead and move this over, cheat with using technology a little bit. And then finally, we need to take the derivative of 3y to the fourth. So we take the derivative of 3y to the fourth. Remember, it's the power rule is happening here. So that 4 comes down. So we're going to get 12y, and we reduce our power by 1. And then here we need to use the chain rule, right? So you take the derivative of the outside. The outside was, hey, stuff's being raised to the fourth power. Leave the inside alone. So that one stays y. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the inside is, again, y prime. And again, we want the equation of the tangent line. For equation of really any line, right, we need kind of y minus some y point is equal to m times x minus some x point. Well, I know an x point and a y point. So I could go ahead and plug these in really at any time. y minus 1 is equal to m times x minus 1. And the only thing that I need to solve for is m. Remember, m is supposed to be the slope, the slope of the tangent lines. Remember, that's another way to say y prime or the derivative or f prime or stuff like this. So I need to know what the derivative is. So that's kind of why I'm using implicit differentiation here to find the equation of the tangent line. So I need to figure out what is the derivative at the point 1, 1. So I'm searching for y primes. I have a couple of them here. And you could take this equation and try to solve for y prime first. It would be a little bit messy. Uh, what I find actually it's much nicer is if you go ahead and you substitute in your special x and y point first. So if I go ahead and stub in 1 everywhere I see an x, I'm going to have a 2 here. And a 1 everywhere I see a y, I'm going to have a 2 here. And then here's 2 times 1, that's going to be 2y primes plus 12. And 1 cubed is going to be 1. And I still have a y prime. So let's see, I'm going to have 14y primes is equal to negative 4. So y prime is going to be equal to negative 2 sevenths after I cancel right, uh, some common factors here. So that right there is my slope. It is my derivative at the point 1, 1. So that is what I wanted for m. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. y minus 1 is equal to negative 2 sevenths x minus 1. 
And if I was on the exam or something like this, I would just leave my answer like this. Now, of course, if it happens to show up as a multiple choice question and it has things, you know, kind of distributed out, it has it in y equals mx plus b form, then sure, you go ahead and distribute it out and get it in that y equals mx plus b form, and that way you can compare against the answers. But otherwise, I would just leave it like this. This is an equation of the tangent line. All right, that is example number one. That's what we're doing uh, with this implicit differentiation, you can see I had implicit differentiation. There was a, a product rule and a chain rule. So I think we got some good examples out for example number one. Example number two, this is a multi-part problem similar to what you saw in maybe some of your web works. Right? A particle moves according to this law. T is measured in seconds, S is in feet. My first thing is that I want to find the average velocity. So the average velocity, this takes us way back to section four of chapter one, right? When we were talking about the average rate of change. So if this is my position function, I want the average rate of change, right? The average velocity. Well, I need to go back and I need to use this F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A. So let's go ahead and uh, plug in some values here. So I have the average velocity on the interval from 5 to 8. So my A is going to be 5, and my B is going to be 8. Man, these don't seem like very pretty numbers. Oops, I was wanted to write B there. Let's see what happens here. So, okay, let's maybe first plug in, right? We have this function, 1 over t squared minus uh, 1 over t. So if I do f of b, or I guess really, I guess it's s of b, s of 8 in this case. Uh, let's see, that's going to be 1 64th, right, when I take 8 and I square it, and I'm going to subtract away 1 8th. So let's maybe go ahead and simplify this a little bit. I'm going to get a common denominator, and let's see, I have 1 minus 8, so this is going to be negative 7 and 64ths. So there's my uh, function's value at 8. Let's get my function's value at 5. So this is going to be 1 over 25 minus 1 fifth. Again, I'll go ahead and get a common denominator by multiplying by 5 on top and bottom. So 1 minus 4, sorry, 1 minus 5 is going to be negative 4 and 20 fifths. So now let's go ahead and plug this into my average rate of change formula up here. So I have f of b, so negative 7 60 fourths minus negative 4 25ths, if you'd like to, minusing a negative is the same thing as adding, all over 8 minus 5. So all divided by, I guess, 3 in this case. So if I was to write out maybe just one more line here, I would write out 4 25ths, subtract away 7 uh, 64ths, and all of this is dividing by 3. Remember, dividing by 3 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 -third. So maybe I'll just do this, just so, so that we don't have fractions over fractions. So this is how I would leave my final answer, right? I wouldn't expect you to really simplify too much more, you know, beyond this on a, uh, you know, quiz or an exam or anything like that. So this is how I'd leave my final answer, right? Otherwise, you could get common denominators and start putting this stuff all together. Uh, but I think this is fine for an average velocity. And this is how I would enter it in web work, right? You can enter in uh, fairly complicated things into web work here. All right, next up, not just average velocity, but find the velocity at a particular instant of time, right? We don't have an interval given to us here. We have just velocity at t. So we have position at a time t. If you want velocity, well, that's where we start using our derivatives. So let me go ahead and maybe mark up here. This was part a. Here's part b. So for part b, we need to take the derivative of this. So let me first start off by writing this as t to the negative second minus t to the negative first, right? Because when you have 1 over t squared, rules of exponents say, well, you can go ahead and move that t squared upstairs, right, up into the numerator, but you have to have a negative exponent. Likewise, this is really t to the first power, and I can move it upstairs so long as I give it a negative exponent. This allows me to apply the power rule quite quickly, right? If I go ahead and I take the derivative of this now, I can see that the negative 2 is going to come down, reduce my power by 1. The negative 1 is going to come down, reduce my power by 1. 
And if you'd like to, you can put it back in kind of the fraction form. So this is with the negative exponents. You could decide to get positive exponents. Uh, and again, these negative exponents here just mean, you know, push it down into the denominator. So this would be negative 2 divided by t cubed plus, uh, let's see, 1 divided by t squared. So that right there is the velocity of our particle at time t. So now part C asks, well, what is the velocity at a particular time? Now that you have this great function, actually use it for something. So we want V of 1, velocity at time 1. So if I go ahead and I plug in 1, well, I'm going to have negative 2 divided by 1 cubed plus 1 over 1 squared. So let's see, this is going to give me negative 2 plus 1. So it looks like negative 1. And uh, for these problems, right, whenever you can, include units, right? So this is a good habit to get into. So let's see, S is in feet, T is in seconds. So velocity should probably be, be in feet per second. Just like miles per hour or meters per second or things like this. So feet per second in this case. All right, there's part C. Part D, what is, uh, let's see, the acceleration after six seconds. So, okay, well, in order to talk about acceleration, I need to get an acceleration equation, right? And so I need to go back and, well, I figured out velocity, that's the first derivative. Acceleration is going to be the second derivative. So maybe I'm gonna look at this for a second, and I'm gonna take the derivative of that function, right? The derivative of velocity will give me acceleration. So if I take the derivative of this, well, the negative three will come down and I get six, t to the negative four, reduce my power by 1, minus 2t to the negative 3. Again, just applying the power rule, let me go ahead and rewrite this. Instead of having these negative exponents, let me write it in the fraction form. So this is going to be 6 divided by t to the 4th, minus 2 divided by t cubed. All right, so there's my acceleration. It doesn't want just the acceleration function, but it wants the acceleration at you know, six seconds or after six seconds. So let's do the acceleration after six seconds. So I'm going to plug in six everywhere I see a t. So this is going to be six divided by six to the fourth minus, let's see, two divided by six cubed. I do notice that one of the sixes up here will cancel with one of them down here. So actually we do have a common denominator here. So it's just 6 cubed in both of these cases. So 1 minus 2 would be negative 1, and I would have 6 cubed in the denominator. Now 6 cubed is going to be, what, 216. I don't expect everyone to know they're perfect cubes necessarily, so kind of either one of these is how I would leave it, you know, on a quiz or an exam or something like this in a time setting. So either one of these, completely fine. All right, and then finally, part E, for which t value is greater than zero, do we have the particle moving in the negative direction? So, okay, when is the particle moving in the negative direction? These are these more complicated ones, right, because we have to first remember what does it mean to be moving in the negative direction? So moving in the negative direction means that you have a negative velocity. So, okay, this corresponds, right, so these are words that correspond to the mathematical equation. When is the velocity negative? When is that less than zero? That would mean that you're moving in the negative direction. So I have a velocity equation, right, right up here. And so I have negative 2 over t cubed plus 1 over t squared. And the question is, when is that less than zero? And so we need to remember how do we solve inequalities like this. And the way that uh, you know I'm teaching in this class, I think it's a quite a good method, is by using this number line idea. So I'm going to use a number line. And remember, we're going to jot down all the places where our function, velocity in this case, is either undefined or when it's equal to 0. So one place, just staring at this right now, I can see one place where it would be undefined is at 0. At t equals 0 we would have it's undefined because you'd be trying to divide by zero here, right? You'd have negative two divided by zero, one divided by zero, right? So that's one place where it's undefined. Are there any other places where you're dividing by zero? Any other t values that you would plug in where you're dividing by zero? The answer is, I don't think so, right? 
So, okay. The other pl places where we need to break up the number line is when the velocity is equal to zero. So I'm going to go ahead and figure out when is my velocity here equal to zero. So, well, first thing maybe we do is we say we hate fractions, right? Uh, at least I don't like the way that these fractions are looking. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply through by the LCD, the lowest common denominator. In this case, it's t cubed. And I'm going to do that on both sides. So if I do this on the left-hand side, well, I have to distribute. So I'm going to have negative 2. And then on the second term, let's see, I have t cubed divided by t squared. This is going to be plus t, right? Because there's one more t in the numerator than there is in the denominator. And then on the right-hand side, well, 0 times anything is just going to be 0. So this gives me the term t equals 2. So the place where the velocity is equal to 0 is over here at 2. So these are our points of interest. In fact, uh, we can recall that it just says when t is greater than 0. So actually, we don't even really need half of this number line. Let me go ahead and maybe erase it here. And I'll just have to redraw it. There we go. So we only care about when the t's are greater than 0. So this is kind of what we're looking at here. This is our number line where we're trying to figure out it, when is the particle moving backwards. So now in order to solve this problem, right now that I've split up my number line, I'm going to choose some test values. So maybe in this interval right here, I'll choose the test value 1. And maybe here in this, interv uh, this, val uh, this interval here, I'm going to choose the test value. And you could do 3, 4, 5, 100, whatever you would like. Uh, I'll be a little bit... Uh, safe here and I'll just do 3. So those are going to be my test values and I'm going to plug those into velocity and the claim is those test values will speak for the entire interval. So here's my velocity right here. Let's go ahead and plug in those test values. So if I was to go ahead and plug in 1, well actually we already did that up here, right? So I plugged in 1 already and I got negative 1 feet per second. So, okay, negative 1. So that is going to be negative. On this interval right here, the velocity is negative. Well, that's actually pretty exciting because that's what I'm looking for, right? <laughs> My little smiley face, right? I'm looking for negative velocities. So on this interval, this is telling me that this is a good interval, right? So from 0 to 2, we like this. Well, what about uh, 2 and bigger? So if I plugged in 3, well, let's go ahead and do that. I'll calculate out v of 3. So I'm going to have negative 2 divided by, and if I take 3 and I cube it, right? So that's my velocity function is that I need to cube stuff. If I take 3 and I cube that, I'm going to get 27. And then, let's see, plus I get 1 over, and 3 squared is going to be 9. Let's go ahead and get a common denominator here. Oops, I need to multiply by 3 on top and bottom over here. And with that, I'm going to have 20 sevenths in my denominator. And let's see, I'm going to have 3, sorry, negative 2 plus 3. So negative 2 plus 3, that's going to be 1 27th, so that is a positive number. So on this interval right here, we have positives. So and remember, these test values, they speak for the entire interval. So when is velocity negative? Well, from 0 to 2, it's negative. And then after 2, it's positive. So in this case, my final answer, and maybe I'll do this in blue, is from 0 to 2. That's when the velocity is negative. That's when your particle is moving in that backwards direction or negative direction. Right? That's what we were trying to figure out. So that's when it's moving backwards. After that, it's moving forwards. All right. That was example number 2. That was our 2.7 example. Now, 2.8, related rates. I saw on the uh, surveys that I had a couple folks who were very interested in a related rates problem with similar triangles. So I, I chose a problem here. This one will actually rely on similar triangles at one point. Uh, and it's on the uh, you know, more complicated side of related rates problems. So, a filter filled with liquid in the shape of a vertex down cone with a height of 3 inches, diameter of 2 inches, and its open end uh, is at the top, right? If the liquid drips out of the bottom of the filter at a constant rate of 5 cubic 
inches per second, how fast is the level of the liquid dropping when the liquid is two inches deep? So there's a lot of information, right? So I definitely recommend with these related rate problems that you should read them two or three times through all the way, and then try to start kind of getting some mathematical equations that relate to this uh, information. Okay, so after reading this through uh, another time or two, let's start doing some stuff, right? So we have a vertex down cone. So let's go ahead and draw a cone and the pointy end, the vertex, right, is facing downward. Now the height of this cone is three inches. So if I was to go ahead and maybe just draw some pictures here, the height is going to be three inches and the diameter is going to be two inches. So you can either draw the entire diameter or quite often, you know, the radius becomes very important. So I'm just going to say that the, if the diameter is two inches, I'm going to go ahead and say that the radius is going to be one inch. So I'm just going to put a little one right here. Okay. Liquid drop drips out of the bottom of this filter at a constant rate of five cubic inches per second. So now I have to decide what kind of quantity is this? Is this talking about a static um, quantity or is this talking about a rate of change? And in this case, you can see that it's talking about how the liquid is dripping out of the bottom, right? So this is talking about how the liquid is changing, right? Five cubic inches each second, right? That's how it's changing by five cubic inches each second. So this actually is going to be a derivative, right? Derivatives have everything to do with rates of change. So this is going to be a rate of change. And then we have to decide, well, what's changing? What is it describing the change of? And in this case, it's describing the change of volume. Right, so five cubic inches, this is the same thing as five inches cubed here, right? This is a unit of volume, right? Each second per second. So this is volume, how volume is changing. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that V prime is equal to five cubic inches per second. And in fact, it's maybe a little bit nicer, right? Since it's leaving the cone, right? Since this is going down, uh, why don't we go ahead and say negative five cubic inches per second to really indicate that the cone's not filling up with water, but the water's actually leaving the cone, or I guess we don't know it's water necessarily, just liquid. Maybe it's coffee or something like this. All right, let's go on to our next part. How fast is the level of the liquid dropping? All right, so that's what we're trying to solve for. How fast is the level of the liquid dropping? So this is talking about maybe some height, right? So I, you maybe have some liquid in here in your nice cone. Uh, I'll shade it in with purple, I suppose. Decently close to blue. And this liquid right here, right, as it drips out, its height changes. So its height is not a constant three. Its height is changing, right? As this liquid drops, drips out, that uh, the height of that liquid is going to go down. So I'm just going to say that this has height H right now. So this cone, this water cone, which sits kind of inside of our filter, our filtered cone, right? This has height that changes. This is going to have height H. So how fast is the level of the liquid dropping? So it's asking about how is this height changing? So our goal is to figure out what h prime is equal to. That's how I answer this question in order to, you know, win the game. And we have one more piece of information, right? It says when the liquid is two inches deep. So we don't care about, you know, how the height is changing, you know, for all time, but only at a particular instance when the liquid is two inches deep. So that's also talking about a height, but not how the height's changing. It's just saying, you know, at a particular instant when H is equal to two. And this is where you do have to be a bit careful, right? Uh, you can either leave your notation like this, and so long as you understand that the height is not a constant two, right? This height is changing over here. Height is not a constant two, height is changing. So this is really height at a particular instant of time. So height at a time A, you know, whether that be five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever, right? We don't know, but at some time, the height of this liquid is two. So 
I'm going to go ahead and use the easier notation, uh, but then we just have to make sure that we realize that h is not always true, it's only at a particular instant of time. And what this means is just, you know, kind of wait to plug this in until the end. Wait to plug in until after derivative. Okay, so with that, we are ready to kind of start doing, uh, right now that we've interpreted the problem, we can go ahead and start doing some math here. Uh, this kind of all is shaped around this idea of volume of a cone, right? So we have this kind of water cone that's changing um, in here. And so we want to know the volume of a cone, right? And you can also see that we have a V prime, we have an H prime, all that good stuff. So. Yes, we need a volume equation. Now, on our formula sheet, we have a volume of equation that says that the volume of a cone is going to be one-third the height times the area of the base. So in this case, right, and this doesn't work for just circular cones, but it also actually works for pyramids, it works for uh, non-circular cones, all that sort of stuff. But you can notice that we have a nice circular cone here. So our area of the base, well, area of a circle, also on our formula sheet, is going to be pi r squared. One third, and then height, we're just going to do h. So right, that's the height of the cone here. So notice that we've introduced this r thing. Let me go ahead and draw r on our picture over here. r is going to be the radius of this water cone. Right? And again, this changes, right? As more liquid drips out, that radius is going to shrink, it's going to shrink, it's going to shrink, and then finally, you know, it's going to be just zero. It's going to be gone. There's not going to be any more liquid there. So there's our radius of our water cone there. Okay, so that is our volume, right? Our volume of our nice water cone. And you can see we have information about V prime and H prime that I would like to plug in. So, right, we need to uh, go ahead and take a derivative of this thing. So as this sits, you can take the derivative of it. The claim is it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's a little bit better if you do some algebra uh, beforehand. You can notice that all of our terms here, right, we have a V prime, we have an H prime, we have an H. Right? All of these things have to do with V's and H's. There are no R's. So if at all possible, I would like to get rid of this R squared. If I can get rid of this R squared, well, that's going to make this volume equation a little bit nicer. So the question is, how can I get rid of this R squared? And the claim is, this is where we're going to need to use similar triangles. Right? If you erase a lot of that picture there, I'm just going to kind of redraw it because I don't want to, you know, completely erase it. So we're going to have the actual filters cone, right? This has a radius of one and a height of three. And then inside of that, there's the water cone. This has a radius of R and a height of H, and these things are changing. But notice that these are two nice right triangles, and they share an angle. So this is set up for similar triangles. So similar triangle says the ratio of these two sides is going to be the same as the ratio of these two sides. So 1 is to 3 as r is to h. 1 is to 3 as r is to h. So there's the ratio of my sides here. Oops, accidentally erased my h. All right, and this will allow us to solve for r, right? So this gives us that r is equal to one-third the height. So everywhere I see an r, I could substitute in one-third the height. So let's go back over here to my equation. So I have one-third height times pi, and everywhere I see an r, I'm going to put one-third and height. And so I need to square that. So I have one-third height times pi. This is going to be one-ninth times h squared. One more line of simplification. Let's see, one third times one ninth is going to be one twenty seventh, and I have pi. Pi is also a constant, so I'm going to have pi twenty sevenths, and then I have one two three h's. So this is going to be pi twenty sevenths h cubed. 
So there is my velocity, it's not velocity, sorry, this is my volume equation, and it's based only on h's. All right, so now we can go ahead and take the derivative, and here's where you do have to be a little bit careful, right? All of these things have to do with time. When I take the derivative, I'm taking a time derivative. So when I write v prime, this is derivative of, velo derivative of volume with respect to time, as time changes. Likewise, when I take the derivative over here, I'm not taking the derivative with respect to h. I'm taking the derivative with respect to time. So when I take the derivative with respect to time, that 3 is going to come down. So I'm going to write maybe pi over 9, reduce my power by 1. So that's the derivative of the outside, leave the inside function alone, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Which that's really good, right? Because I want to know what h prime is. That's my whole goal here is to figure out what h prime is. So if you forgot that h prime, you'd be stuck, right? We wouldn't have anywhere to go. All right, v prime is going to be negative 5. And let's see here, h, h was supposed to be 2, and we wait until after the derivative to plug that in. So I already took my derivative here, now I can plug that in. Notice if you were to plug that in beforehand, if you were to go back maybe up here and just plug in h equals 2, you'd get a constant, and then the derivative of the constant is 0. So again, the mistake here is that we're hiding some notation that the height is not always 2. This is not h of t equals 2. This is h at a particular instant of time is equal to 2. So you do really have to decide between, you know, kind of uh, technically uh, correct notation, right? Because that's where kind of all of the reasons, the whys hide, uh, or kind of making it a little bit more readable, right? Uh, and so, yeah, just do whatever works best for you. All right, so again, I plugged in two everywhere I saw an H. There we go. And so my final answer, again, I'm solving for H prime. That's what I'm interested in. Let's see, I'm going to have negative 5, and that 9 is going to come and join it. So I'm going to have negative 45 divided by, and it looks like 2 squared is going to be 4, and I have pi in the numerator, so I'm going to divide 4 pi on both sides. So that's going to be negative 45 over 4 pi. That how, is how the height is changing, which makes sense, right? Negative value here. The height should be decreasing since liquid is exiting this thing. Uh, and then let's go ahead and get some units, right? Anytime you can, put units with it. So it looks like our units, as far as, you know, height and, uh, you know, dimensions like this, it looks like inches, right? We see two inches deep, cubic inches, right? These all seem to be in inches. So this is going to be inches. And remember, this is how it's changing. This is how H is changing. So it's going to be inches per second in this case, right? Our time unit seems to be per second, so inches per second. That is how the height is changing, and there's my units, and that's my final answer. All right, looks like we're just over 30 minutes, still have one problem to go, so I'm going to go ahead and keep this party rolling. Uh, use linearization to approximate the square root of 24. So linear approximation, remember, we don't get calculators or anything like this. We want to use linear approximation. Uh, so we need to remember the linear approximation equation, L of x, is equal to f prime of a times x minus a plus f of a. In some notes, you know, we may have f prime of c times x minus c plus f of c. So the big thing is that this a value, the c value, is an x, it's a number x, right, uh, that is nearby what we want to evaluate our function at, but usually we know how to evaluate that function you know, at that nearby point. That was relatively confusing. Let's just use this concrete example to, you know, uh, for this problem. So the square root of 24, I have no idea what that is, but I do know what the square root of 25 is, right? The square root of 25, 25 is quite close to 24, and we know that the square root is going to be 5. So in this case, right, my function here is the square root function. So it's the square root of x. And I'm interested in finding out what is f of 24. That is the square root of 24. And according to this section, right, this is going to be quite close to, this is going to be approximately equal to the linearization at 24. So if I know the linearization's equation, and then I plug in 24 into that, 
right? That would be quite close to the square root of 24. So finding the linearization at 24, that's my end game. I still need to know what is my particular linearization equation. What's my L of X? Well, again, we need to choose an A value, right? I'm going to be plugging in 24 in everywhere I see an X, but I need to choose a value for A. And again, that A is some number that's close to 24 that we can actually evaluate our function at. So that's why A is equal to 25 in this case, because it's quite close to 24, and we can actually evaluate our function. The square root of 25 is just 5. Okay, so we're going to use A is equal to 25. Now, let's go ahead and calculate out a few things. We need F prime of 25 times x minus 25 plus f of 25. So again, f of 25, that's just my square root function. So if I plug in 25, I'm going to get out 5. In order to do f prime of 25, well, I'm going to need to take the derivative. So let's remind ourselves that the square root is the same thing as x to the 1 half power. And if I take the derivative of that, f prime of x is going to be equal to, well, the 1 half will come down, and I get x raised to the negative 1 half power. Right? I reduce my power by 1, that's the power rule. Let's go ahead and rewrite this for a minute. I'm going to push that negative exponent down into the denominator. So let's see, this is going to be x to the 1 half power. And then finally, x to the 1 half power is the same thing as the square root. Remember, that's kind of how I started this whole thing. Square root of x is x to the 1 half power. So there is my derivative. And remember, I want f prime at 25. So f prime at 25, that's going to be 1 over 2 times the square root of 25. Well, the square root of 25 is just 5. So 2 times 5 is going to be 1 tenth. So this is going to be 1 tenth. So that right there is my linearization equation. We could use this to approximate the square root of a whole bunch of values. But in this case, I want to approximate the square root of 24. Right? So now I go back and I'm looking at this right here. If you want to approximate the square root of 24, we want to use the linearization at 24. So now I'm going to go ahead and plug in. Everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a 24. And so, let's see, we get uh, 24 minus 25, that's going to be negative 1 times a tenth. So that's going to be negative 1 tenth plus 5. Or you may write that 5 minus 1 tenth. And actually, I'm quite happy with that answer, right? Because the square root of 25 is going to be 5. Well, 24 is a little bit less than 25, so I would expect my answer to be a little bit less than 5. And the question is, well, how much less? Well, the, according to the linearization, it should be about one-tenth less. Right? So it's around five, but it's one-tenth less. All right. And with that, <laughs> there's my last example for uh, our video for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope this is useful for you. Uh, and I wish you good luck studying for the last few hours before the exam tonight. Uh, again, if you're taking it here in East Lansing, uh, we're going to be starting at 7 o'clock, 7 until 8.30. That's the exam time. Uh, and we're going to be meeting in B119 Wells Hall. Again, please bring a pencil eraser and uh, you know your MSU, net ID, your MSU ID or at least a driver's license, stuff like this. Uh, there are other opportunities you know, for the practice quiz and the practice exam that you, sh you could be doing uh, between now and the exam. And if you're taking the exam at an alternate location, just make sure you show up a few minutes early that you can deal with parking uh, and that you can find the room and all that good stuff. Uh, just try to minimize any issues uh, that could occur tonight. So, all right. Yes, thank you very much. And I will see you guys, well, maybe tonight. See you then.